Well, thanks, Ian. Thanks, uh, Rod, for having me today. Uh, I'm going to just walk through a, a quick case here. Um, and then also probably spend a little bit of time talking about, you know, some of the nuances or application of MIS uh, to manage these uh, common thoracolumbar injuries. So this was a 19 year old woman that presented, she was an unrestrained passenger involved in a motor vehicle accident, highway speeds, She's otherwise healthy, no other medical problems. And when she got to the hospital, uh, she had a clear Asia A spinal cord injury uh, with motor and a, and a sensory level at L1. Uh, she also arrived with uh, other systemic injuries, multiple intra-abdominal injuries and a unilateral long bone fracture. He had a head CT and the imaging of the rust for neuro axis uh, was negative outside of a clear 2-3 injury that I'll show here in just a minute. She was taken straight from the ER uh, by the trauma surgeons for an x lap. Her abdomen was left open and packed, but she was hemodynamically stable after repair of a liver lack and a splenectomy. So this was her imaging. Uh, as you can see here, she had a, a clear disruption of the disc as well as what uh, appeared to be on MRI, clear uh, interspinous ligament disruption. Uh, I'm showing the L3 pedicle here uh, and then the L23 uh, uh, set on the contralateral side. And so what we did for her, and I'll, I'll go through this and then talk about you know, the, the way that uh, we treated her, is we took her for a percutaneous stabilization and uh, stabilized across that 2-3 uh, fracture and we're able to get her off the bed there uh, you know, in about an hour. So despite having that open abdomen, we're able to quickly get her treated. And in terms of uh, decompression or arthrodesis for her, we did not do uh, any sort of arthrodesis. We did do a decompression there where she had uh, some stenosis, uh, but did not do anything uh, to the individual facets. So interoperably, and again, I think just going through this, uh, you know, the, the workflow, I know my workflow is probably different than my colleagues on here today. Uh, when I do this, uh, even though we have robots and stealth, I still like to do these uh, with fluoroscopy, treating each level independently. So even if they have a rotational injury, um, you can cannulate the pedicles in the AP trajectory and again, just treat each level independently and so we'll place wires at each level in the AP, move the C-arm over to a, a lateral trajectory before we place the screws. If we are going to do an arthrodesis or a decompression then you can decorticate each one of those facets still prior to placing your screws and then go ahead and place our screws in that lateral trajectory. She was flexible enough that, uh, and unstable enough that we were actually able to get a nice reduction just by contouring our rods and bringing the spine back to the rods. And then this is that final view. And so I, I would say that my practice patterns have changed um, and uh, you know, wasn't based on these recent guidelines, but certainly this gave me some reassurance uh, for the way that I had been treating these patients. And I know Dr. France is going to talk about TLIX, so I won't spend a tremendous amount of time uh, on this. But uh, I would say that it seems that the patients that we see most are these ones that wind up in this TLIX4, where it, it tends to be that surgeon uh, decision making. But I would say that that management, uh, whether it's a TLIX4, uh, is largely driven by whether they're intact or have a neuro deficit. And I think my practice initially was, is I probably was more conservative if there was any sort of neuro deficit was driving me to doing an open decompression. And I think that that probably uh, is still my bias, but not always. And I think that we have some capacity here uh, for stabilization and stabilization with fusion uh, or potentially a non-fusion option, again, for these TLIX4 or these TLIX that are greater than four. But again, I won't spend a lot of time on this since I know Dr. France is going to dive into this. But at the bottom line now, I think what we can clearly say um, in terms of managing these very common injuries is there's really no difference open versus percutaneous on the correction you're going to get for the vertebral body height, kyphotic angle, 
and then the pros at 24 and uh, uh, 12 month follow up, and even the fusion rates. Uh, what I can say is, at least uh, it, you know, my own experience and what appears to be uh, mounting in the literature is that percutaneous had less blood loss, decreased operative time, less infections. Thanks. Uh, Zach, great lecture, and thank you so much for joining our trauma faculty. And uh, the obvious question as a senior member of your department in charge of the spine division, the infamous learning curve um, comes up inevitably when we talk about new technologies. How do you handle that, especially as you have um, so many trainees walking in and out? How much time do you give them to try to learn percutaneous versus open techniques? How much radiation limits do you place on the learning curve uh, uh, ex uh, exposure? I would say, and I would be interested to hear what the other uh, panelists would say, but I, you know, trained all open with little in the way of uh, MIS. And I think actually that facilitated the adoption of more MIS is because conceptually it was easy to uh, understand where the anatomy was with fluoroscopy. And I worry a little bit now, um, you know, you mentioning learning curve, we're becoming more and more, um, I think, adept at using stealth, using robotics, but also there's probably going to be some some consequence to that, uh, you know, truly understanding and, and being independent of it. I work uh, pretty hard to make sure that, you know, they are using fluoro, but to your point, um, you know, it can be a, a painful learning curve, uh, particularly with a, a more junior resident that may not uh, even be comfortable with pedicle screws. So just one more question before we uh, head on to John France. Um, the the question is, should we then maybe have a training situation where we really facilitate open conventional management and then as a higher level, allow those who've passed that uh, level of maturity to go on to percutaneous and MIS techniques? I think that's an absolute requisite for it. If you don't understand it from an open perspective, then uh, in my mind, you have very little business doing an MIS. <laughs>